Well, welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. Pleasure to have you join us again, if that's what you're doing. If you're here for the first time, let me remind you, we are the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation representing individuals and groups who support this peculiar thing of one man, one woman marriage. And uh, every week I say, look, other things uh, take place in society. Of course they do. And uh, discussions of those things. Well, that's not really what we're here to do necessarily. We're here to talk about the benefits, the uniqueness of one man, one woman marriage, how we think that marriage is the thing which describes what only one man and one woman uh, can do. I thought I'd take an opportunity just to let you know as well that uh, we do go up and down the country holding public meetings. We're planning our schedule of visits for next year. We also uh, attend uh, churches and other organisations as invited for free. So if uh, your organisation or one that you know would like us to come and give you a talk about the evidence and the arguments in support of uh, man-woman marriage and uh, issues associated with that, we do uh, men's breakfasts, we do Wednesday evening meetings, we do all sorts of things. Please get in touch, admin at c4m.org.uk and we would love to come and see you. We've got an interesting guest today and this guest today, first let's just say hello to him first of all, uh, Reverend Mark Smith. Mark, say hello to everyone. That's great. Well, hello everybody. Yeah, it's really great to have you. And listen, before, before we jump in, I just want to tell people, because when we chatted uh, a while ago, I was telling my wife about our conversation and she said, no, you misheard. I said, I didn't miss here, honestly. I didn't miss here. Yeah, you misheard. But I didn't. And you're going to be as, as amazed as I am uh, once we get into Mark and, uh, and what he's about and what he does. Now, your normal day job, Mark, you are a senior pastor at River of Life uh, Church in Dumfries. Yep. That's it. Yep. Great. And how long have you been there? So, oh my goodness. Well, we've been in Dumfries since 1980. Uh, yes. So that's when my wife and I got married. And yep. then uh, worked for the government for a little while. And then we got involved with the house church movement in the 80s. And yep. so uh, out of that eventually came what is our church now, founded in 1988, called River of Life wow. Church. And give us a little feel of the congregation size, etc. So we have uh, about 100 people turn up on a Sunday. We probably, if everyone came on the same day, it'd be more like 120, 130, something like that. A lot of kids, uh, quite a few students. Uh, we've seen substantial growth, really, in the last few years. And we also get really involved with the community. So we have a food project which runs every night distributing free food to, to anybody that wants to come for it. And we also run a really good coffee shop in Dumfries Town Centre called King's Quick Plug. Ah, ah, and, ah well, uh, I, I'm going to have to come and visit that sometime. The best coffee around, yeah, absolutely. Good yeah. stuff. So it means we can employ Excellent. people through that as well. So we, we're really community focused, but our, um, you know, our passion is obviously yeah. about God. And and just just for those who might be interested, your, your doctrinal basis, are you Baptist, are you Presbyterian, are you... So we would be um, evangelical, uh, yep. sort of Hillsong-y, contemporary. Yep. It's great to talk to you. It's great that you're doing that work. And let me just put it out there that um, we have uh, supporters from all faiths and none. There's a lot of Christians, of course there are, and uh, Christians of all sorts of denominations and all sorts of areas of Christendom. A lot of people of different faiths, a lot of people of no faiths at all. I'm regularly interacting with atheists and, and all sorts of people. The thing that ties us together is that thing I mentioned about marriage. Now, as a pastor, Mark, you will occasionally marry people in your church like most pastors do, correct? Yeah, I've done that yeah. since 1988 when we first But here's, here's the amazing yeah. thing. Yeah. I want to get straight into this, right? Because um, uh, how many couples have you married this year? Well, um, by the end of the year, then I will have married, uh, well, at the moment, 421 couples. Um, so most of the, so, you know, most of them I've already done. So I've, I've married about 400 people, uh, 400 couples so far. Right. So let, let me just get that. So um, Liz, if you're listening, 420 couples. I was right. I was at. No, that is utterly bonkers. What's going on? Tell us how on earth that's come about. What's what's happening? Well, there's a little place along the road from from where I live uh, called Gretna Green. 
Ah. So it is quite uh, famous world round uh, yep. as being, um, you know, a place to run away and get married in. Yep. So in um, Gretna Green, then we have uh, a team of people like me who marry people. So we're all, um, you know, authorized celebrants in Scotland. And um, there's about five of us really that do religious weddings. So you can choose to have a civil wedding, which is with a registrar council employee, or you can choose to have a, uh, a religious wedding, which is um, from one of us. <laughs> wow. So that's so how it happens. And of course, lots and lots of people get married at uh, Gretna. Now, I did check to find out how many have been married this year so far. So they were registering, I think, I've got the number, number 3960 when i spoke to one of the registrars yesterday so that was actually registering that wedding but then they worked two or three weeks behind and then there's the rest of the year so it will be about four and a half thousand people get married um <clears throat> administered through the grand registration office yeah that's a lot and yeah that is and you've done about 10 percent of those right? so about 10 percent yeah it's yeah, me yeah yeah, that so that is astonishing. I mean, a lot of questions spring to mind. I mean, as well as supporting marriage, you know, the the idea from our point of view is is we want people to get married because it's it's great because actually it makes sense for, you know, fr from a sociological sociological perspective, all the evidence says people are happier, healthier, they do better when they're married. Kids do exponentially better uh, when they grow up with their married mum and dad than in any other type of relationship. The evidence is abundantly clear about that, but. We want good marriages and lasting marriages. Now, the whole thing about Gretna Green, uh, it's got a bit of history to it, hasn't it? And, and, you know, people, you know, on the spur of a whim, perhaps when they're drunk on a Saturday night, let's go up and get married. Um, does that still happen or? or... Not exactly, no. Um, it, of course, it used to be. Um, the history is very long and complex, so I won't bore everyone with that. Yeah. But... Essentially, it was uh, mid 1700s, 1748, really, that it kind of developed, where the um, the law in England sort of developed more quickly in relation to administering weddings and legalizing weddings. In Scotland, it was more relaxed, and so and it and it it wasn't nationally registered. So basically, you know, anybody that was respected in the community could just write out a piece of paper say saying that they married this couple and, and that was binding then um right. so so basically um it all kind of developed from there there was a period where you could just arrive and do that uh, then they insisted that you would be resident for uh, three weeks in scotland right. and uh, now uh, you have to give 29 days notice is, is all that's required it right. used to be 14 uh, just until six or seven years ago but yeah. Those to sort of stop sham marriages taking place, so it gave the registrars time to um, sort of check people out. So it's twenty nine days notice is the minimum. Um, so that you do have that, ex that extra fifteen days will do the trick, won't it? I know. <laughs> so it's it's not a question of having to you know leave a suitcase in a hotel or something, or you know to mark your residency, or you don't have to do that. No, anymore. you don't have to be resident at all. Right. Uh, okay. You can do every, okay. everything can do be done remotely by yeah. post and by email and so on, by yeah. phone. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, yeah, most people probably don't come in advance. Uh, they plan it yeah. all from a distance, uh, do the paperwork, and uh, then come and get married. And then yeah. go home and or so go on honeymoon. <laughs> Let's talk, let's talk about the motivations and why do people go there? So there's uh, a number of different re reasons that people go to Granny Green. And um, I think, I mean, it is cheaper. So, you know, with the average wedding uh, being, what, £35,000 or something now, then people can go to Granny Green and spend, you know, probably less than a 1000 if there's just the two of them or, uh, you know, a couple of grand, and they uh, can bring some guests with them and stay overnight and have a nice mm. meal, blah, blah, blah. So so there is a real um, sort of cost um, advantage. It makes getting married um, possible for many people who would otherwise think this, mm. this just isn't on our radar because it's far too expensive. Um, I think we see a lot of people who are going through second marriages, you know, they've uh, either been widowed or divorced. Um, we see quite a lot of people who are older and perhaps been together for 30, 40 years and realize that in their, 
you know, advancing years, then um, it's much better if they can be legally married. I mean, they've generally considered themselves married. Mm. And then we often have families who, you know, say we planned to get married years ago and then kids came along. And so we just haven't um, got around to it because life's been so busy. This is a big one for many people. Then the, the, the whole family carries the same surname. And mm. so, you know, suddenly mum now becomes the same as, as the rest of the family. And uh, it's important for the kids. You can see how proud they are that now there's a strength come into their family unit, which wasn't there before. Mm. And then that, you that's see interesting. Them, yeah, isn't it? Mm. So yeah. those are the sort of yeah. motivations that I find. So do you find, I mean, do you find any, as a, as a, as a pastor, I mean, you, you mentioned some of those groupings there, people who have who've got divorced, who are then getting remarried. Do you find kind of any difficulties uh, objectively from your own perspective that things were on? Uh, and how do you deal with those things? It's a, it was a big question that I had to deal with, particularly when I first started doing this. You know, I've never found anyone who went into marriage intending to divorce. And, mm. and everyone that I meet to speak about their divorce, speak about it with regret. In other words, it was a painful experience to go through, not something that they want to do again. And, you know, they've learned some lessons through their previous experience. Mm. And so now they want to make this one right. That's, that's the prevailing attitude that I find from people. And so, you know, in asking for a minister to marry them, then they say, we want God's blessing on this, rather than just go through the legal stuff alone. Jesus offers us a fresh start in life uh, when we realize that we've messed up, we've made mistakes. Um, so here we are, you know, a new beginning. And uh, let's, uh, you know, really pray for God's blessing. How many people would you say you've married in total? Um, it's many thousands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. several yeah. thousand because i've been doing yeah. this the gretna one for about 12 years and uh, so you know on average it is between four and five hundred uh couples yeah. a year so what would you say ha having and that you know frankly outside of certain um sects and churches that there would be very few people that have had that kind of experience what would you say have been the key learning points, maybe, or, or, or the key lessons that you've picked up? Stuff that other people wouldn't have come across? Very, very good question. I think one of the biggest things for me as a pastor is that I see a really wide cross-section of people, ordinary people. You really catch a temperature of where people are at. And so for me as a pastor, you know, working predominantly in the church environment and you know on the sub christian subculture then it, it was really enlightening and refreshing i think to discover who ordinary people are and to find that people have just really basic needs um, which are you know to be loved to feel secure uh, to to uh, live a life of peace <laughs> and, uh, but also to find some fulfillment and See, this is, this is this is me as a pastor again. I think the church really needs to be amongst people because they need us and they appreciate us. When they've discovered that we're, all, we're ordinary people, but we've got something mm. super normal because we've got this connection with God. And it means that, you know, we can be, we, we genuinely can be joyful in every circumstance. Mm. So, so basically, yeah, I think it's been refreshing to get along such a, a wide spectrum of ordinary people and to realize that, um, you know, the church and, and the gospel is relevant to absolutely every person. And out of those, out of those, I don't know, four or five thousand people, um, are there any that stand out, that stick out in your mind for either for good reasons or bad reasons? One that really stands out was um, a couple who I arrived um, to do the wedding and the groom was inside the venue and the, the bride was just coming outside. And anyway, I got in and he said, I just can't go through with it. Um, I, can't, I can't do it. So, you know, I sat down with him and I said, you know, what is it that's the problem? And he said, I just, I just don't know if I'm doing the right thing. 
Um, and you know, I've known her for such a long time. She's a really amazing person, and I really, really love her. But I don't know if I can actually marry her. And so that was a, a serious problem, really, because they were about to be married, and just the two of them. So the witnesses were staff in the venue. Um, so then I said, "Well, I better go and talk to your bride about this." So I went outside and and met her, and she was all dressed to go in there. The wedding gown and things, the the uh, bride's dress, and so I said, "He's he's really nervous. He's having second thoughts." And she said, "Oh, I knew he would." <laughs> so she said, "I'm not surprised at all." And so I said, "Would you like to come in and we'll just have a chat, and you know, we'll see where we go from here." So she came in, she sat down. She wasn't angry with him. Um, she she knew him well. And so I just then, you know, instead of being a marriage celebrant, then I became a pastor. I said, you know, tell me about everything. And so uh, they were obviously quite wealthy. And she said, he really struggles to make decisions. Mm. And she said, we went to buy a boat the other day and he couldn't decide which boat to buy. And she said, I had to decide which one it was. And he was happy with that mm. one. So, so, so it was. And so I said, well, you know, what's your decision? And he said, um, I can't do it just now. So I said, well, you know, go away and think about it and talk about it. I've got some other weddings to do. And then if you do want me to marry you later, then give me a ring and we can do it then. So anyway, went away a couple, couple of hours later, then I got the phone call and he said, yeah, I'm going to go through with it. So <laughs> here we are. We actually did it. And we had a lovely time. But the thing is, the marriage schedule, which is a legal document in Scotland that we that is prepared by the registration office. So that's got all the details and they do the legal background work. And um, so first thing I need to do is to take the marriage schedule, but it actually lists the occupation. So I was really intrigued to see what he does for a living when he was so indecisive. Anyway, it's an airline pilot on the, <laughs> on the profession. Uh, so I said, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. I need to know which airline you work for because I won't because travel I'm, with them. You I'm know. not going to fly with you. <laughs> uh, but um, the interesting thing was he then fully made his decision. We had a lovely ceremony and, uh, you know, they went away rejoicing. Um, but the point was, he said, I can make decisions at work. I don't have any problem about making decisions at work. It's just in my personal life where my emotions are involved. And uh, so That's I think that reflects probably yeah. where many people are at as well. You know, we've, yeah. we've got our and in emotional fairness, I think it, in guys, work, I think. We've got our emotional uh, and then we've got our work, you know. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And so many things. Yeah. So as, as a pilot, everything will have been trained into you and systematized and you follow the manual, you follow the response. But hey, in matters of the heart, there isn't really a manual, is there? Uh, and that's and, and that's the that's the thing, the scary thing. But honestly, uh, y you and I will know that marriage is is well. First, it's the most painful thing you will ever do, and and you you've got somebody who can hurt you more than anybody else, who can upset you more than anybody else, but somebody who can love you and make you happier than anybody else, and and those two things together, it just makes marriage like a a, a wonderful wonderful thing. It really does. And I, I think the thing that I see, you know, when I'm looking into couples' eyes, then the thing I see is the desire for stability and security. Yeah. And one of the, you know, you, people come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, of course. And mm -hmm. so yeah. sometimes, you know, there are gobsmackingly beautiful brides and, oh. uh, you know, just have natural beauty. And um, one of the things that always amazes me is that their grooms are often quite, you know, Mr. Average. But um, <laughs> almost, in fact, well, almost entirely, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and 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 I think that um, you know what what beautiful women are looking for is a really caring husband. And yeah. um, they've probably had all the, you know, good looking guys chasing them for years. And then they find somebody who is tender, is kind hearted, is understanding, will listen to them. And they say, that's the guy for me. So, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite sincere, extraordinary seeing yeah. what draws couples to each other. Well, and, and I would say it's that sense of care and um, consideration 
which um, which really bonds bonds people. And, and, and you know, commitments. getting married is a, is a is a whole thing of you know we're making this That's bond, right. which um, you know is hard to break. Yeah. It's a little bit easier yeah. now, suddenly. But uh, you know, yeah, I think most yeah. people think I'm not going into this lightly yeah. Um, yeah. because because yeah. I really wanted to join us together with strength. And that's that's the other thing about marriage. I mean, it's, for, it's the public commitment. It's also the fact that, you know, I will never leave you nor forsake mm. you. And you that's know, what as, the as, vows as say. The, yeah. For better, yeah, yeah, for worse, yeah. for richer, yeah, yeah, yeah. for poorer, in sickness and, 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 and you in know, health. And that's wonderful because marriage, all marriages have their ups and downs, their good days, their, their not so good days. And you know that there's a, there's a, 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 we know in our marriage, there's a minimum below you below which you will not go. You know, you are always there together. We've committed to each other for life. So we may as well work this out because it'll make life a lot easier if we do work this out because none of us are going anywhere. So, you know, let's work out how to, how to do this as well as we possibly can. Um, and, and that's all. There's a few things you mentioned which I, I want to pick up on. Uh, first of all, the, the cost of weddings, which you're absolutely right, uh, is ridiculous. Um, and uh, we spoke to Mark Regnerus. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a, uh, a popular author on, on, on various subjects, including marriage and Christian marriage. Uh, and he speaks about the research that actually, um, you know, th often the cheaper the wedding, the more successful the marriage, you know, because it's about something more. And I, I've got, you know, as a, as a dad with three daughters, um, you know, I want to let them know that they're going to be nearer the £1,000, not the £35,000. Let's make that quite clear. <laughs> but you're absolutely right that really, you know, the, 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 there is a degree to which weddings and expectations and prices and, you know, nobody can afford that kind of money and that kind of thing at the start of. And maybe that's why people are getting married later, because the expectation you can't spend that kind of money earlier on when you're young at the beginning of your careers. Uh, what are you finding in terms of the people that you're coming across? Are there many young people? Um, trends. I don't know. I don't know that it's changed an awful lot um, mm. in the time that I've been doing it. Um, you know, Gretna is is more um, would be. So I tend yeah. to see the the dates of birth on the yeah. map schedule rather than thinking of the ages. Yeah. So uh, we have a lot of people who were born in the 70s and in the 80s. Um, mm. So, you know, those are the two big decades yeah, really. of dates of birth. So that's um, like 50 and 40. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah okay. so that would be the that would be the, you know, the most uh, frequent. But then we sometimes, really? um, you know, have the, have the younger ones, uh, even post 2000. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the weddings we do are traveler weddings, which are uh, mm -hmm. something completely um, different, really, a different culture altogether. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and very, I mean, I enjoy them a lot because they generally have quite a respect for God. Can I ask a, a flippant question? Have you ever had a day with four weddings and a funeral? Oh, yes. I yeah. have actually, <laughs> literally, uh, okay. with a funeral. Uh, I oh. mean, I, I have many days with four weddings, and you know, you say I did four weddings today. So, uh, when weddings take place in your own church, I'm guessing you take a bit more time about them. Yeah. So, um, obviously, that's a different kettle of fish altogether yeah. because yeah. we give yeah. uh, we have run a pre-marriage course, and we've got several couples just been through one. And we, uh, you know, give them a whole lot of support. So the, the Gretna weddings, I'm more providing a service for yep. uh, where people get married in our church. Then, uh, you know, we, we've got the whole pastoral yeah. care yeah. Uh, in advance and, and, of course, afterwards as well. And, uh, mm. yeah, it's, mm. it's a different now, sort of wedding, really. As, as I said at the, the, the top of the interview, we, we, we see marriage as the thing that describes uh, what a man and a woman can do. Now, other things take place in society. You completely understand that. Um, all sorts of different variations from that. Uh, you don't do same-sex uh, weddings. You've, you've said that. Um, but let's move on a little bit to, to talk about, if that's okay, the stuff that's going on in Scotland. Yeah. I mean, how would, you, how would you know whether or not you're marrying a man and a woman, for example? Yeah, well, they do have to declare it. So... Um... The, you know, if if somebody was, I mean, I have been asked about, you know, trans weddings um, in 
which can be quite complex because of you know which or both or so on yeah. and uh, thankfully when the uh, amendments came to the marriage at scotland 1977 then um they were uh, 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 they were um, accompanied by protections for uh, a number of different cases. So, you know, particularly for uh, Christian ministers. And so in terms of discrimination, then there's an exclusion from any uh, possible um, prosecution for discrimination on the grounds, either of sexual orientation or uh, of, uh, you know, sexual yeah, um, yeah. change so yeah. uh, or, or identity so so that's nice to know um so you know we can keep it simple uh, between a, a man and a woman now of course yeah. often get asked the question you know why don't you marry uh, marry same-sex couples um two reasons first of all legally basically i'm not licensed to marry same-sex yeah. couples yeah. um yeah. so so that's uh, you know a very kind of straight and easy answer yeah. i think then we come into uh, the whole um you know side of why why don't i or mm. well it would be up to our trustees mm. as an independent church to nominate me uh, mm. to be so-called upgraded um and i think you know as a as a church along with many other churches then we realize that spiritually and if we're going to you know base our church on anything then it has to be on scripture otherwise we kind of just making up our own religion mm -hmm. then uh, scripturally there's no precedent for same-sex marriage and uh, you know much as we might want to try and find a precedent then it's not there uh, and what is there is the definition of marriage as being one one woman and one man and so you know we've got genesis 2 passage about that mm. and then jesus reinforcing that very strongly with his expression that that's what marriage is and then we've got the apostles uh, with the epistles in the new testament all expressing the same thing so you know to my mind even if i was to try and find it then well i can't find any any uh, justification um as to how to change what's been the understanding of marriage for thousands of years um the only thing that you can do is to say, well, these are different times, so, you know, we've got to uh, move with the times and uh, we've got to see, you know, that uh, we don't want to be disconnected from society or viewed as being um, alien to to where common culture is going. But as a pastor, then, you know, mm. well, and not even just as a pastor, as, as a believer in Jesus Christ from... You know, when I was nine years old, then my whole life is based on, mm. well, what does the Bible say? And, mm. um, you know, if I start to then try to say, I wanted to say something different, then, um, well, where do you stop, actually? Because, you know, is it going to be multiple partners? Is it going to be... Mm. Uh, well, that's know, the thing. That's yeah. the thing. And once you start oh. pulling that thread... Do you um, lose... It, it, well, it, it, it leads down some pretty strange alleyways, really. How long do you think, because, uh, I mean, Scotland uh, are, would see themselves as, as uh, quote, progressive, unquote, uh, and really are trying to, to lead in the whole redefinition thing and, and uh, pushing people down a route of celebrating things that they might not otherwise sell. And this is the funny thing, of course, because nobody's forced to believe in Christianity, um, but uh, the, it's almost like, well, you've got to change what the Bible says and you've got to change. But no one's forced to believe it. You can not believe it and you can invent your own version if you want to. Um, but, you know, don't tell those who believe the Bible that they've got to change what they believe because that doesn't make any sense. But how long do you think you'll be able to carry on doing what you're doing in Scotland? I don't really know. I think, um, I mean, Scotland's really interesting um, I've lived here since you know, 1980, so that's what 42 and a half years now. Yeah. And um, so, you know, in that time, I've actually seen Scotland change quite a bit. Now, when I moved here in 1980, 
then it was it was still illegal uh, for for men to commit homosexual acts with with other men. Uh, that was only abolished in 1980 and acted in 1981. So uh, not that it was really used, I don't think, um, you know, up to that point. But um, that was much later than England. So Scotland is is inherently or historically is actually quite morally conservative. Um, it was even politically conservative at one point, um, which not many people know. So that's quite an interesting aspect as well about Scotland. So really, in the last 40 years, and there's been quite a revolution. And um, I think it's been predominantly socially engineered. Um, we ran a Christian school in our church for about 16 years because we could see the way that things were going. And we could see how that social engineering was actually working out in education. And it was quite um, focused, I think, on trying to tear down... Mil militant, almost. Militant. Militant is probably yeah. the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. And uh, so we pushed back against that. And um, we were one of the first in our region to homeschool. We've got five kids. So, you know, we had a house full of, of kids and then others joined us so we started a christian school and uh, so you know we our local council had to write the rules literally because we were the first ones doing it at the time and so um you know we we didn't entirely know what we were doing or why we were doing it we just were so uneasy about what was going on in education so i think what we're seeing now is probably you know a generation or two down the line um, which has which has tried to uh, change perceptions in Scotland quite dramatically. Um, however, I do think that beneath the surface, then uh, many people um, are are uneasy. Uh, probably don't know exactly why they're uneasy, but um, just uneasy about the changes that are happening and about why they're happening. I think probably the current debate about um, about identifying a gender. Um, well, it's more than a debate, actually. It's uh, almost uh, law. Uh, and, and we've, as a church, you know, we've made representation to the Scottish Government about that when we've had the opportunity, and also to our MSPs, who have been very understanding, actually. Um, but I think that um, is probably, might just be pushing things one step too far. Uh, we'll see. But um, I think that, you know, many Scottish people are looking for a sense of um, identity. And so, you know, politically, that's being provided. Uh, but I think then they're thinking, well, um, you know, we've got some political identity, but actually we're still unhappy and we still don't quite have what we should have. So, so anyway, my um, hope and prayer is that you know, we come to a point where people actually begin to see reason and uh, and begin to see that the traditional way of doing things is not necessarily bad. That actually traditions can be good because they're well established and they've worked for, uh, you know, uh, centuries. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. But, of course, nothing's new under the sun. All this sort of thing has happened before and generally comes around the circle. So that's what I'm uh, hoping and praying for. I'm interested in, in your views, just um, two closing questions, really. Why are we going in the direction we're going? And then what can we do about it? And the first one, I suppose, is um, everyone knows, because the evidence is very, very clear, that you know kids growing up with a married mum and dad produces the, the, the best version of the next generation by a long way it's not close in terms of educational outcomes and you know there will be cases on both sides where that's that's not the case but on a population basis it's very very clear that you know th this is how society runs well is kids growing up with a married mum and dad it, it, it works on a population basis so knowing that um, why would a why would any government want to promote almost anything but that? It's a very I mean, good question. Why? And, it's like and why? I think we need lots of people to ask that question um, and 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 to actually you know seek answers um, 
uh, I mean, it, it can be frustrating. Um, the, the Scottish government has a good system of, um, of, of inviting views from the public. And, you know, I've taken that up on behalf of our church and individually in, in many issues over the years. And, uh, you know, attended consultation events and, uh, you know, responded to uh, invitation for, um, for evidence and, and all the, the good things, really, which the Scottish Parliament has in place. Um, but at the end, when you read the reports, then they take what the public say many, many times. And then they say what the so-called experts say, and the experts will almost always receive much more attention and credibility than the public do. That's a, that's a trick, a sleight of hand, because yeah. they it pick the experts. As if doing well, the they open pick the thing. experts who they know what, who are going to say what they want them to say. You know, yeah. we had exactly the same thing in Wales. The expert panel. Well, what an interesting bunch of people they were. And of course, they said what they said, irrespective of the fact that the population wanted something completely different. Overwhelmingly, both times they were asked. Oh, yeah, yeah but the expert panel, you know, we know better than you. We'll tell you how to bring up your children because you don't really know, do you? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that's, I that's have, awesome. you know, so well, I have quite a few MSPs friends, uh, and you know, I, I speak to them, um, you know, quite often. And um, and you know, the ones that I know best are in opposition, <laughs> and so they, uh, you know, are equally frustrated um, because, and some of them even sit on committees, you know, and and then yeah. uh, have their voice almost silenced when the report comes out then it says you know we have dissenting voices from that mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually explain what those dissent dissenting voices had said uh, in any you know sort of tangible detail so there is a, a great de degree of frustration but in the end it comes down to the ballot box i think and uh, you know the public perhaps changing their uh, criteria yeah. uh, and perhaps voting to do more with moral issues and with freedom of speech yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. with uh, things that affect yeah. society rather than yeah. uh, you know purely some kind of yeah. political bando and re recognizing that actually if you get those moral issues right mm. the economy and everything else it will works. take care of itself that's because right because actually you'll have people who make moral decisions for the right reasons in office and then other things might work out too hey ho that's you know, right it it's, might even it, sort it's itself simple. out <laughs> yeah 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 they make but, selfless decisions based on what's best for society as opposed uh -huh. to their own individual interests i know yeah yeah uh, it's, it's, old so, thing, it's those sort of ideologies i think which mm. have permeated the upper elements yeah, of right. government yeah and yeah. um well, once they get entrenched it's quite hard to get rid of them because um you know they they are like professionally entrenched so yeah. they haven't just happened to occur they are actually engineered and i'm i'm not a conspiracy theorist but you can see yeah. how no. um you know people can take human behavior they can take yeah. the media they can take you know words and uh, position them in such a way that actually gets people on side without realizing what they're saying yeah. so yeah no you're quite right and and a lot of people a lot of people will listen uh, to what politicians say will listen to the media says and that's why you know the the, the as, as it's called the long march through the institutions was so important because a lot of people with respect don't think about things too much and just listen to what they're told uh, and so you know down at the other end outside the schools and outside the universities when they suddenly come across facts and evidence the other way well it's a bit late by that point you know um, so getting them in the process and it has to be said that most media are very selective and are only looking for a particular story, to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been part of that um, yeah. and, and, you know, done interviews and things and almost been told what to say because yeah. that's what they want. So yeah. um, I know how it works. But, uh, you know, I think as individuals, we are in a democratic society. The way out, the way out of this, you can tell me if I, if, if you think I'm right, but I think the way out of this really is down to the churches, encouraging more people to get married younger, to marry well, to stay married. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if uh, there were more pastors than you up and down the land who were marrying 400 couples a year, 
because and that's the way out you know civil society is built from the bottom up that's we right. can't wait for the politicians we can't wait for the media because mm. they're just not interested it's we're the people we've been waiting for it's down to us people like you people like me other people that see marriage for what it is and want to promote it and you know let's encourage people as much as we can to get married as soon as they can have lots of kids and just taste and see how wonderful that part of life can be that's right and i think if we if we are married as i am over those 42 yeah. years then you know we need to be personally ambassadors for marriage and yeah. uh, also work at our own marriages so that you know they are generally yeah. genuinely good and that makes us yeah. happy but also really sing the praises of um, you know marriage and and, it uh, is, you know, it's, and, it's and just, show it people yeah. the benefit of being married yeah, well done. Listen, Mark, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I wish you all the best with the ministry um, and uh, many more marriages, and I hope they're all successful. Um, perhaps you can come back and, and tell us how it's going sometime. Love to. Yeah, thanks ever so much. Mark Smith, privilege to talk to you. Take care. You too.